Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went up to be registered, every one to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you, you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go down to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have taught us to include the reading aloud of your word as we gather together in your presence. Thanks for being here. That's why we've come. We are gathering together in your presence. Lord, you've got us at a very special place in your word. Lord, you know exactly what it means. You know exactly how to apply it to each and every one of us here. Lord, you know where we're at in our spiritual walk. But I ask that you would touch each one here from the youngest to the eldest and help each one to take a step closer to you. Father, you know how to grow up your people. You know how to mold and shape us into the image of Christ. And Lord, that is the desire of our heart. Lord, even our neighbors and folks that we meet are talking about Jesus as a babe, but we recognize, Jesus, you are so much more. Grant us wisdom as we reach out to let others know the good news of salvation that is found in Jesus Christ. It's in your name we do pray, Lord. Amen. For the last few weeks, we've been studying the lead up uh, to the birth of Christ. The emphasis in scripture is the incarnation of Christ. How does holy, almighty God, creator of the entire universe, take on human flesh? But that's exactly what has happened. That's exactly what has been prophesied, what we've studied at this point, and here we see the fulfillment of that. You see, God the Son has always been God. From eternity past to eternity future, there is only one God. He is one in essence. He is one in his nature, revealed in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And in fulfillment for what the prophets said, it is God the Son who is the one who will take on human flesh. 
God the Father so decrees it. God the Holy Spirit accomplished it simply by coming upon Mary, speaking. Just speaking. That's it. That's how God creates. He speaks a galaxy into existence out of nothing. God creates all there is. He speaks this earth into existence. He speaks everything on this earth into existence. That's how God creates. Out of nothing, God speaks. And then his creation comes forth. And God but spoke by his spirit. And that's how we have God the Son placed in the womb of a virgin. And so what was uh, known to only a few, now the number begins to grow. And we won't go over what we have studied, but we want to know the scriptures well enough that we can plant the good news of the incarnation of Christ in the hearts of our neighbors and friends and co-workers and family members who have honest questions. Honest questions deserve honest answers. You don't want to give myths or your opinion uh, as an answer. Always go to the word of God and plant the word in their hearts so the spirit of God will watch over that and use that to draw them unto Christ. Somebody shared the word with you. Somebody shared their testimony with you. Somebody prayed for you. And now you have the privilege to pass the good news on. Well, we get to the point where it's close for Mary uh, to deliver. Everything has to be in agreement with Scripture. Everything has to be in agreement with all those prophecies concerning the first coming of Christ. They must be literally fulfilled. Now, as you and I study the Old Covenant, we study the Old Testament, we discover there's actually more prophecies about the second coming of Christ than the first coming of Christ. But, and you'll notice even in several of the songs that we sing, which we call Christmas carols, the authors knew prophecy about the second coming of Christ. We're not only saying about the incarnation of Christ, the birth of Christ, but then uh, the Savior who comes, the one who dies on the cross, the one who pays the price for mankind's sin, the one who will be coming as uh, the conquering king, uh, the one who will establish his kingdom, and he will rule and reign, we are told, out of Jerusalem for a thousand year period. You notice that was mentioned in some of the carols that we sang. Now, for those of you who didn't get to be here the last couple of weeks, you didn't know you were going to be the Christmas choir. But for those who were here the last two weeks, we practiced those songs. Uh, most of them a couple times, some of them just one time, because uh, we want to be able to sing them unto the Lord. Many people think they know carols, but they know the first line or the last line of just a few carols. They don't really know some of those carols. And of course, there are many which are very well grounded in the Word of God. So thanks for coming and thanks for singing out uh, unto the Lord, singing not only about the Lord, but singing to the of the Lord in praise and adoration. We see that we're in good company. This the passage that we read here. The host of heaven sing. That's more than angels. You, you understand those who were the saved who were already in heaven, they sang the host of heaven. Those Old Testament saints who died looking forward to the Savior who was going to come. Those who were already in glory get to bless the Lord, get to sing unto the Lord. The angels get to sing unto the Lord. There is a lot of excitement. We live on this side of the cross. It's the new covenant that is in Christ's blood. And we love to sing about Jesus and we love to sing to Jesus because he is worthy to be praised. And so this is a good time to emphasize the incarnation of Christ. We have discovered in searching the scriptures that the day that Jesus was born on cannot be determined from the Bible. Now you can dig and dig and dig and just, you know, you cannot determine the exact day from scripture. Which means, evidently, that's not too important to God. Because we know the exact day that he died on, and we know the exact day that he rose on, and we know the exact day that the Holy Spirit came. We know all those things, the dates that are important God's put down. But the date of the birth of God the Son, uh, the one who is the Son of God and the one who is the Son of Man, is you cannot determine from Scripture. 
you can guess two seasons that's the best you can do one would fall in the it would in the fall time one in the spring and that's uh, we we won't go back how we get to that but it, that's the most honest answer but you know what December 25th is as good as any to tell people about the incarnation of Christ and if you forget and you don't tell them any other time of the year that's built in because that's part of the gospel that incarnation of Christ mankind cannot claim credit for Jesus Christ because he he is born without any sin being passed on you know, on a human strain and you and I are born in sin scripture says nobody had to give us lessons man from the time we came forth we knew how to sin and we kind of got better at it didn't we yeah now Jesus had none of that sin passed on none whatsoever and that's why the the incarnation of Christ is so amazing he is tempted in every way that you have ever or ever will be tempted and yet he was found without sin he never sinned in thought word or deed Jesus has always been God and he never ceased to be God for the time that he was in Mary's womb or that he was a child that he was a teenager or he was a young man having taken on human flesh he has never released it at this very moment Jesus Christ is God the Son and he is the Son of God and he is the Son of Man at this very moment Jesus in heaven is all God and Jesus in heaven is all man that is an important point for followers of Jesus Christ it's why we have gone over it for several weeks it is one of those things that we cannot budge on we cannot yield on the incarnation of Christ he is not a man who became God he is God who became man so different than all of those myths and that you had to study uh, in high school Greek mythology and Roman mythology and all those various gods that uh, we had to study about there's only one God and he has only one son one son and that is Jesus of Nazareth that is Jesus Christ our Lord for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved oh it's, that's that's the whole purpose uh, he is Jesus is so much more than a baby and Jesus has absolutely nothing to do with the commercialism that has crept into our culture and that is so linked to this time of year you know you want to share the truth about Jesus so something real and cannot be bought Speak unto your neighbor. Go back in just a few highlights. We are told when this comes, it says it came to pass in those days that the decree went out from Caesar Augustus. He was the ruling Caesar of Rome. Uh, he was 1,400 miles away. That all the world should be registered. He wants to know where's the money going to come from. And the whole purpose of registration was taxation. So he orders it all through his kingdom, not just in this small part and not just for those who were Jewish. But Mary and Joseph are caught up in that. And because they are Jewish, uh, when it, the order is to go, go, they would have to go to says this census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria and this is a man of history and you can read about him uh, the first time he was uh, the governor was from 13 through 3 BC and the second time oh, I should have jotted it down it's from about 8 uh, AD to about 14 this is the the first time around and if you ever really get into trying to figure out now exactly when was he born you're going to discover a few things would you believe that jesus is born in about 4 bc 5 bc say how in the world is that possible because uh we are people and the guy who uh came up with what we call the christian calendar was about four to five years off <laughs> 
so it's hard to believe that we've got Jesus is actually born in about 4 BC. He has to be. We know the date that Herod the Great died in March of 4 BC. It's a, it's a date that is fixed. You know, these are educated people as far as the Romans. We still read a lot of their records. Uh, and so uh, we, we know the approximate you know, time when these things uh, take place. All of this had to take place because God shared with Micah 700 years previous that Bethlehem is going to be the birthplace of the one who is called Emmanuel, the one who is God with us, the Savior who is to come, God in the flesh. And because as God spoke to various prophets and it took place over hundreds of years, every single one of those prophecies dealing with the first coming had to be literally fulfilled. And God, did, if, if, if you've got to move a whole bunch of people for it to be literally fulfilled, that's fine. God will go to great lengths to prove to you that Jesus is the one who fulfills the law and is the one whom the prophets foretold. He will go to great lengths to convince an, an honest heart, someone who is truly searching, that salvation is found in Jesus and Jesus alone. Dig deep. Ask the hard questions. Look deeply into the life and the testimony of Jesus Christ. He is the only one who fulfills the law. He is the only one who fulfills the prophets. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father but by me. That means there is no salvation for anyone from Adam to the last human being unless it is faith in Christ. Specifically what Jesus did on the cross, paying the price for mankind's sins, dying in your place. He did not die a martyr's death. He died in your place. He died uh, so that you would have an opportunity to know the reality of forgiveness of sins, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the gift of eternal life. Your, your reservation is secured in heaven. You actually have a life worth living in Christ. You discover who you are, why you're here, and where you're going. You know, if you miss Jesus, you miss your whole purpose of being human. If you miss Jesus, you miss out on the whole reason that you were conceived and that you were born. And it's good news. Jesus desires that you would know your creator and you would have fellowship with him, that you would enjoy him forever. You do not have to keep secret the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have Jesus, uh, we have uh, at a certain time, in a very busy time, in a very chaotic time, in a time when the Romans who were the ruler class, the nation that was subjugated, they were not a free people. They had to obey these foreigners. Uh, God was going to use that for good. Now, I know that we sing about uh, a real peaceful night and a wonderful night and all that but it was far from it. It was far from it. I mean, there are so many people that were on the move. Most of them related. Somehow, if they're going back to Bethlehem, they have to be related somehow. Uh, they, if they are uh, part of David's extended family, they're related somehow. There were so many people that came from so many places that Bethlehem was overwhelmed. And so all of the in, uh, the places in the inns were taken, and the places in the homes were taken, and the encampments that they would build at these times round about, they were all taken. Literally, there was no room anywhere, and all they could offer was, well, we have a stable. Stables back then aren't exactly what we think of as stables today, most likely more like a cave where you kept all of the, all of the animals, but it's a place that you can get in and out you're not in all these crowds there was a lot of uh, merriment there was a lot of uh, hey it's been a long time since we saw you people ignored what God was doing they ignored what was going on it wasn't important that this guy shows up with his wife and that she is pregnant you have God moving in their midst and most folks missed it completely
So there were those that God brought it to their attention and recorded it because he said, those who live later, I don't want them to miss this event. I don't want them to be cut, off, cut up in all of the chaos at this time of the year, all of the crowds at this time of the year, all of the travel at this time of the year, all of the, I can't, you know, I, I can't uh, get there because somebody's got my place. You know, they're supposed to have so many horses and now we don't have any horses and there's supposed to be so many camels and now we don't know all the camels and I've got a reservation and I show up and there is no reservation and they're expecting me. All of the chaos that was going on at that time of year. There was something marvelous that was taking place. There was something wonderful that was taking place. There was something eternal that was taking place. And some folks were so wrapped up in the busyness that they missed the move of God in their generation. Now, folks, if that doesn't sound like this time of year in our culture, I don't know what does. There are folks who are just so busy and so moving around from one place to the next and so chaotic what's taking place and then things don't work out and you get stuck somewhere that you can really miss what this this is supposed to be all about they went to be registered everyone to his own city this would be in fulfillment with micah chapter 5. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. Why? Because the Messiah, the Savior, can only be born in Bethlehem. To fulfill scripture, that is the only place, not in Nazareth, not somewhere in between, not down the road. You got Jerusalem just five miles down the road. It has to be in Bethlehem in keeping with Scripture. You know, various prophets saw various things. Hosea saw that the Messiah, the Son of God, would be called out of Egypt. And that literally happened. Mike is the one who saw that birth had to take place in Bethlehem. Daniel's the one who saw the time. And we studied that when we studied Daniel. Isaiah's the one who saw all the titles that would be given under this one. And the job description uh, that would be given. Different prophets saw different things. They all had to be fulfilled for Jesus. Do you understand that for a prophecy to be only 90% correct means you are a false prophet and they can take you out and stone you to death? It has to be 100% correct. 90 is not a passing grade with Almighty Holy God. It must be completely right. And the prophets got it right literally fulfilled in what Jesus did. Bethlehem had had some spectacular things. There were some things that you could know about Bethlehem. Bethlehem's first mentioned in the book of Genesis, that 35th chapter. And Jacob is with his family and they're coming back and he's, his, his uh, favorite wife, his wife Rachel, is uh, bearing their second child and Joseph was the, their first. Uh, he would have become number 11. Well, number 12 is on the way. Benjamin. But remember, she goes into labor and she dies at Bethlehem. And it's dying. She said, Call him Ben Onai, the son of my suffering. And his daddy said, I'm not about to give that name to my boy. Amen. I'm going to call him Benjamin, son of my right hand. There's different ways to look at things, aren't there? And we call him Benjamin. Joseph's younger brother. But Jacob buried his favorite wife in Bethlehem. So this was known as, as the place of her burial. You have some generations pass and then you have Ruth. And Ruth and Naomi, when they come back, where do they come back to? You know, Naomi's home area, Bethlehem. And so Ruth remarries in Bethlehem. And she uh, be actually... Uh, bears a child and you, you go two generations and you end up with David in yeah. Bethlehem. So folks became, they, 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 David was born there. They didn't know about David till the prophet Samuel was called and he was sent to Jesse's house and he was told there he would anoint the next king, the one who would replace Saul. 
So Jesse had eight boys, but the youngest was out with the sheep. So when the prophet came in and everyone was frightened, do you come in peace? Yes, I come in peace. Okay. It's kind of a scary time. Have we done something wrong? Do we need to get something right uh, with God? He said, no, I've come to sacrifice. Prepare yourselves. We'll sacrifice unto the Lord. But while he had, was doing that, he, he went to Jesse's house and he asked him to bring his sons. And the first seven passed before him. And from the very beginning, he said, boy, these, this, this guy looks, this guy is tall and he's handsome and he's strong and, and he looks like a king. And the Holy Spirit spoke to him, don't look on the outward appearance. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. This is not the one that I've called. And he kept going, you know, from the oldest all the way down, seven, seven boys, and there was none of them. And he turns to Jesse, the daddy, he says, you know, you got any more sons? I, I imagine if it's like me, it's like, man, I hope you do, or I've missed Jesus in this thing. In other words, it wasn't the same. He said, yeah, we've got one more, but he's out with the sheep. I mean, we got the kid, you know, we kind of got the run of the litter out there. I didn't even think it was important enough to call him in. Well, we call him. And sure enough, here comes David. Said he was ruddy. All that means is he didn't shave yet. And the Holy Spirit said, that's the one. You anoint him to be the next king. So from that point on, we always have Bethlehem linked, you know, as, as this town of David. When David was uh, toward the end of leading his own armies and the Philistines had invaded again, we discover in 1 Chronicles, the 11th chapter, and David is in the stronghold and they're battling and it's kind of a rough spot and... He, he, he just speaks out loud. He said, man, I, I would love to have some of that water, that good water from the well in Bethlehem. Oh, how I would just, I'd like that. And evidently, that was something special. That tasted good. You know, three of his mighty men. Remember, he had the top three, and then he had the 30 and all. Out of the love of their hearts, they got through the Philistines. They fought their way in there. They got that water and they came all the way back and they brought that water to, to King David, whom they loved. And David was shocked. He was so humbled. And, and he just, he didn't realize that saying that, that someone would, they would risk their lives. And that water was way too special to drink. And before them all, he offered it as a drink offering, as a pouring out offering before the Lord. He poured it out unto God for those men's love and for them willing to sacrifice their lives. Those are some of the things that we know about Bethlehem before this night. And here's another glorious event linked to Bethlehem. And then there's going to be a very sad event in probably a few months from this time when a number of innocent young children are going to be slaughtered in the area. There are certain things we remember about Bethlehem. It was not a big place. Micah referred to it as a little place among uh, the, the multitudes in Israel. You know, I don't know if you're from a big place or a little place, but God has a purpose for you. And God works in the little places and God works in the big places and he works in the small families and in the large families and the small congregations and the large congregations. The key is to have an open heart to the Lord and to be uh, obedient when he commands you to do his work. We know that as that birth took place and I can only imagine uh, that's tough. Mary is such a remarkable sister in the Lord. We've already seen her grounding in Scripture, her deep love for the Lord. Uh, she knows how to minister under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. She prophesies. You know, she's a prophetess. She's just an amazing sister in the Lord. But to give birth as a virgin is going to be a little extra painful than the way most would experience it. We hear no complaints. We hear no, you know, this is, uh, Joseph and Mary are a wonderful couple. And there's got to be something very special about them. What's neat, you and I will get to meet them when we go on to heaven. 
God lets the shepherds know something special has happened. And to their credit, they said, let's go see. Let's go see. We've just got a word from the Lord. Uh, we've, we've, we've had a heavenly chorus sing. We've had angels make a declaration. Now, what do you do? Do you just sit around and talk about it? He said, let's go see. Let's get in on what God is doing in our generation. Let's go see if there really is a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and of all places lying in a feeder, <laughs> a feeding trough. That's what a manger is. You know, you know, who's ever heard of putting your kid in a feeding trough? Boy, that's a very clear sign they got the right kid. And it's swaddling cloths. You know, Jesus started off in swaddling cloths and his body was buried in swaddling cloths. That's how he started and ended at physical time on this earth. So the shepherds went and all oh, they rejoiced. We were not dreaming this. God is moving in our generation. God is doing something in our generation. The Christ is present, the one we've waited for. And so anybody who listened to them, the scripture says, they wanted to pass on that good news. We are told that Mary hid these things in her heart. Doesn't know how all this is going to come out. Something's going on. Don't know all that's going on, but God's present. God's moving. Do you know that God is moving in the city of El Paso? That God is moving in our generation? There are a lot of folks who are so busy and they're running around and there's chaos and they're going from this place to that place and all sorts of stuff. Don't miss history. Jesus Christ is alive and well in the city of El Paso. Jesus is building his church in the city of El Paso and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You have the privilege to recognize a move of God. Be a part of that. Keep your heart open. As God gives command, as God gives instruction, as God gives unction, then obey the Lord. Get in on what God is doing. Join God in his work in the city of El Paso. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so glad that you, uh, you love people. You love us. Jesus, thank you for being born of a virgin. Thank you for living a perfect life. Thank you for taking our place on the cross. Thank you for dying. Thank you for being buried. Thank you for rising again. And thank you that you are alive forevermore and that you are present at this moment by your Holy Spirit. Lord, you are moving in this generation. You have not forgotten your people. You are still building your church. And Lord, we want to cooperate with you. We desire to be a part of what you're doing. We live in a hectic time, Lord. We live in a busy time. There's all sorts of stuff going on and people can't get together and people are fighting one another and, and there's such squabbling and all. But Lord, in you we find purpose and in you we find peace. In you we find salvation. And Lord, we recognize this peace is promised in the, in the declaration. And it's for those who humble themselves and cry out to you for your presence, your forgiveness. Lord, we want to walk in that peace and live in that peace that is only found in a daily relationship with you. So we put ourselves in your hands. God, draw those here to your side whom you desire. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.